Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Father Ben Shambaugh. I'm the rector of St. Luke's Church, and it is an honor and a privilege to welcome you here this evening for yet another episode in the East Hampton Historical Society's Winter Lecture Series. This topic tonight is of special interest to me. We hosted a Martin Luther King interfaith celebration here about a month and a half ago, and we began with a, with a territorial, uh, territorial acknowledgement, not only not acknowledging that we are on what had been Man Montucket land, but also that some of the wealth which built this church, as well as built this community, came from slavery or industry related to the slave trade. And when we said that, our, our church historian, Liz Marigold, who's here in the back, did some research. And this church was built after slavery had been abolished, but some of the money from the families that supported us, particularly one family, did. It was a slave-owning family right, right here in this area. So did slavery or income rel related to slavery help build St. Luke's? Well, yes. Several stained glass windows, a chapel, and the rectory where I live. And that reality changes the way that you see this community and the way that we think and understand ourselves. So this in plate site project fits so well with, with that, that personal discovery which we had here. So it is a, it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, I want to begin by welcoming our good friend, Steve Long. Thank you. I'm Steve Long. I'm the East Hampton Historical Society's Executive Director. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Ben and to the whole crew here at St. Luke's for being so hospitable to us. Um, you know, they've been just the whole series just terrific. Uh, I want to especially thank Barbara Borsak for suggesting this evening's uh, presentation. So uh, she's done wonderful work for many, many years on the winter lecture series, and uh, and this was really her brainchild this this evening's uh, presentation. Um, when I became executive director just over two years ago, I was very excited by the prospect of working with the Plainsight Project, uh, which is one of the, it's really, I would say, one of the most innovative history projects, certainly in New York State, perhaps in all of the United States. Uh, because of the Plainsight Project's research on slavery in East Hampton, the Historical Society can now tell stories of Abigail, Jack, Prince, Sharper, and many other enslaved Africans who lived and worked at Mulford Farm, just two doors down. I'm thrilled to introduce Donna Marie Barnes and David Rattray, co-directors of the Plain Sight Project. Donna Marie began working at Sylvester Manor Educational Farm in 2014 as a volunteer and history docent. In 2016, she joined the staff as the curator and archivist and began drawing from the Manor's collections to present annual exhibitions. She has made uncovering the lives and identities of enslaved and indigenous people a central part of Sylvester Manor's mission. Before joining Sylvester Manor, Donna Marie spent over 30 years working in the photography field as a photographer and photo editor for Essence and People magazines, and as an editor at the Gamma Liaison Photo Agency. A lifelong resident of Nineveh Beach in Sag Harbor's historic Sands community, she grew up photographing the area and curated Collective Identity, a highly acclaimed tintype exhibit at the Eastville Community Historical Society. David Rattray is the owner and editor of the East Hampton Star. He is the fifth member of the Rattray family over three generations to hold that post. A graduate of East Hampton High School and Dartmouth College, David was a field archeologist for the American Museum of Natural History and was an associate producer for documentary television programs. 
for, for Design Division, a museum design firm in New York City who worked on projects for the Catawba and Mashantucket Pequot nations. He returned to East Hampton in 1998 to work at the Star, becoming editor in 2003, succeeding his mother, Helen Rattray, also uh, you know, steeped in East Hampton history. So please, join me in welcoming Donna Murray Barnes and David Rattray. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here tonight. We're very excited to do this talk uh, for the East Hampton Historical Society. And thank you, Steve and, uh, and uh, Benjamin, for having us here at the church. And for all of you for coming out on this Friday evening. And thank God it's not raining. <laughs> so as you heard in my introduction, I'm Donna Marie Barnes, and I now uh, I'm now the Director of History and Heritage at Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island. And together, uh, David and I sort of have this side project that we call the Plainside Project that we've been doing for about the last five years. And uh, it, it's great to be able to, to bring this presentation to you tonight as opposed to five years ago when we started because we know so much more and we're so much better at it. Um, and we have so much to tell you. Um, so this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about the project. We're each going to do something different and give a presentation. We're going to read something that we've each written about some of the research that we have done, and then we'll do a question and answer time. So I, I hope not to be um, redundant for those of you who've seen us talk before. Um, yes. Yeah, it's much better. Um, uh, about the origin of the project, which is really an accident. Um, and uh, in 2017, um, I wrote a column in The Star about a man named Ned, who had his headstone had been found propped up against a uh, shed, and he it was put back in the place it thought it was be down off Morris Park Lane. It's a little piece of town owned, or town of East Midland. You can see Ned's grave yourself. And I wrote in the star that nothing more would ever be known about Ned. And I got a call, and it, it was basically from someone uh, who had been in the town records and seen that Ned was all over the place in the town records. And I was really embarrassed by that, because I thought that, um, you know, I ought to know that, that black people were in the town records. I, I ought to have noticed, but I hadn't. And I asked an intern uh, just to look at the, uh, the church registers that the Reverend Nathaniel Hunting kept, and then after that, um, uh, Buell. Uh, and she, I, I think she, she just went through and found the names of people of color. They would either be identified as Negro or colored. Sometimes you could tell from the name. These are, there's a certain naming pattern that becomes very apparent when you work with uh, slavery. And, and be enslaved. And very quickly, summer of 17, the intern came up with a list of 330 possible enslaved people. <coughs> it was that easy. It was a book, it was a book I'd grown up with. It's volume five of these 10 town records. And many of you probably looked at it. In the back, it looks sort of look like appendices, are these lists of baptisms and births and deaths and also of marriages. Um, and, there, and there are an astonishing number of people of color in those records. And that was really the genesis. And then Donna Marie and I, maybe a year later, started to sort of gently collaborate. Um, one of the things that I ran into, not being a historian particularly, a trained historian by any way, um, was I had no idea if what we were doing was valid history. Taking a bunch of names, trying to figure out if these people were native or it's African or something else. Um, and, and Donna Marie was one of the people that, that we turned to kind of for what I thought would be the, the sort of reality check to see if we were right and if we were onto something. And it was quite an amazing first meeting. Um, I think my daughter came and another of the interns 
uh, the, the following summer. And we, you know, I don't know if, if, if how many of you have been to Sylvester Manor, but it's an extraordinary, extraordinary property um, on Shelter Island. Dr. will talk more about the history, but we met in, I guess what had been a little living room or something, and then it's sort of a bay window and some chairs, and it was really one of the more emotional moments, certainly sort of professional moments I think I'd ever had. We, we both kind of looked at each other and realized, oh, we're onto something here. And uh, I think that the, 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 the connection between Shelter Island and East Hampton, and between Shelter Island, East Hampton, and the rest of the world, the Atlantic world, is really something that we're just beginning to understand. And it really did start, I think, with the two of us sitting down and, and kind of our mouths mm -hmm. open and realizing how big this thing was. Do, do you want to sort of pick up on that meeting? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that, that day when mm -hmm. David came to Shelter Island, we didn't really know each other. Um, we had met before and he came to me with this information and was very tentative and when he said the number of over 300 people that they had quickly found the names for, I did burst into tears and we, we realized that we did have something here and although each of us are not trained historians, uh, through the years we have become more comfortable with our role as history storytellers. Uh, as history seekers. And from that list of those names, which was an astonishing uh, a discovery, you know, David growing up here, part of a multi-generation family, my growing up here in, in San Harbor all of my life, I didn't know that there was slavery on the east end of Long Island. I didn't know there was slavery in San Harbor or Shelter Island. It was a shock. Um, and to learn the depth of it, to learn how prevalent it was. And so from learning these names, you know, listed in the town records, we began to find connections, that these names uh, belonged to individuals who lived in every house that you would name, uh, up and down Main Street, all through East Hampton, all through Sag Harbor, uh, because I worked at Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island, my focus of study began there with the history of Sylvester Manor, which I knew had been a place of enslavement from the very beginning when the Sylvester family, as the first Europeans to come to Shelter Island, arrived uh, to, to create what we call a provisioning plantation, meaning that they owned plantations in the West Indies on the island of Barbados, and, and Shelter Island was used to uh, import the raw materials and foodstuffs that they needed because they had used all of their land to plant the very lucrative crop of sugar. And the workforce was transported enslaved Africans, who they then brought a number of to Shelter Island to clear the land and, and grow crops and raise livestock after they had purchased the island first from a Connecticut businessman for 1,600 pounds of sugar, and then again after they were sued by the Manhattan people who were the indigenous ancestors of the land, they successfully sued them in, in the court in Hartford, uh, and they had to rebuy the island, this time for 800 pounds of sugar. So I knew that as part of the work that I was doing, and trying to uncover through documents uh, the history of the enslaved people going beyond their names. So over, the, over these, mm, going on five years, going on six years maybe now, we have moved from just finding the names to being able to tell you uh, facts about their lives uh, beyond who enslaved them, what houses they lived in, uh, but to be able to speak about them uh, moving them from slavery to freedom. Slavery ends in New York in 1827, a fact that I'm sure nobody in this audience was taught in school, no matter how good your education was. That was a part that was never... We didn't learn about slavery in the North, is that right? Right? And we all had great educations, but that part was omitted. And so in, in bringing this history to light and being able to tell these stories of these individuals who not only lived here, but are, as we say, 
among the founding fathers and mothers uh, of our community, the whole East End, not just East Hampton. You know, we started here in East Hampton and I started on Shelter Island, but it quickly became evident that this was something that was endemic of the entire region. Um, economics were based on slavery, every household. It's different than when you learn about slavery in the South. You know, there aren't large plantations. There will never be a, a, a place that had, you know, 100 or 200 or 600 enslaved people. But in every household, there was one, there were two. If you had a big farm, you may have had five. You may have had women working in your house and the men working in the fields. If you were the blacksmith, you would have enslaved boys being your apprentices. Which if you extrapolate the story, and because we're both journalists and that's what we do, then you have to say, okay, so if enslaved boys were the apprentices of the blacksmith, and one of the first things an apprentice to a blacksmith learns to do is make nails, and then, then the enslaved boys working as the apprentices, making the nails, that were then building the homes and the, and the businesses and the churches of East Hampton, that means that the building of this town was done with materials provided by enslaved people. And it is our responsibility to be able to name those people and say something about them and to acknowledge them as part of the founding of the place that we live. I want to give a little context to the Okay. Um, I want to make sort of two points before Don Marie uh, does the next thing. Um, one is our method. Uh, mm -hmm. We we'll refer to the town records, but the the, the the reason we call this the Plainside Project is really the information is everywhere. Uh, we look at wills and manumission records. There are uh, what are called run, well, now Freedom Seeker advertisements, which are runaway. You know, we have them from the Sag Harbor uh, paper uh, before slavery ended. So we start as far back as we can looking at any kind of record there is. And at the beginning of this period, you have the first reference to an enslaved person in East Hampton uh, by name. It's a woman named Boose, or Booze, depending, uh, B-O-O-S-E. And she was probably African, maybe native, not really clear. She seemed to be married to a man named Jaffet. We learn of her two ways. One is from the account of the Goody Garlic Witchcraft Affair, because Boos was at the bedside the night that Elizabeth Howell, she was a gardener, died and testified to what uh, Elizabeth said in her suffering. Uh, he picked me with print with pins, I think, is something that Boos testified to and backed up the, the, uh, the testimony of the men in the room. Boos turns up about 10 years later in uh, Mary Gardner's will. Uh, Mary Gardner's the first, well, she's married to Lion Gardner, who lived up here at that time. Um, and she leaves Boos and Jaffet and Increase to her daughter, I believe. And we didn't, I didn't know what Increase was. It seems very obvious in retrospect. I thought Increase was a heck of a name for uh, a person. That's pretty, pretty, pretty intense. No, children. That's what that meant. That Boos, Jack, and any of their children were to be left to her daughter. So that's, um, I think it's 1657. There's a, a death of an unnamed black boy on Gardner's Island, I think around 1645. There's earlier people referenced in South Hampton. But the reason I'm dropping these dates, not to confuse you, but to give you a sense of the span of time we're talking about. To get to 1650s, all the way up to 1827, we enslaved people in East Hampton seamlessly. And if you think of King Cotton, for example, many Americans really, probably the majority of Americans, think of as North American slavery, um, that doesn't even really begin until about the time of the Revolution and doesn't get going until the widespread adoption of the cotton gin that Eli Whitney claims credit for, um, which was 1793. 
So if you think about the span of time, 793, all the way back to the 1640s, Southampton, for enslaved people, you've got this astonishing more than century and a half of <coughs> history and enslavement and black people being part of this community against their will. Um, generally, there's another, there are always exceptions. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that. But I think that helps give context for what Donna Marie is going to read and what, what I want to say is that even though it's so, so much time and so long ago, you know, in East Hampton we hold on to everything. We really are a community of hoarders. And um, we held up the records. And, and that's where we're still working and still finding names. I do think probably a week doesn't go by where we're not pulling uh, a new name, new individual, and now we're beginning to find generational relationships, which I think is something you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. 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 So this evening we're going to change things up a little bit from the way that we usually do our talk, because David and I could sit there like that and chit chat back and forth <clears throat> till the cows come home, um, and it's what we'd like to do. But tonight we're each going to read you a little story, and. We call them stories, and this is how it's written. And this is a story about a, a freeborn black woman uh, who was born on, Sh on Shelter Island and lived her entire life at Sylvester Manor. And through the years of doing this research, and because we have had time, and because I at Sylvester Manor have had the time and the opportunity to do deep dive research, the pandemic really helped, actually. <laughs> we were home, there was nothing to do, and so it was like going down rabbit holes and following. It's like doing genealogy. You know, when you find that thread um, of a mention of somebody's name in a last will and testament, and you think, well, I've seen that name someplace else, and then someone else will refer to them. And the beauty of the archive that we have at Sylvester Manor is that, A, they never threw away. You think you're hoarders in East Hampton. They never threw anything away, any piece of paper that they ever wrote, any letter that they wrote to each other. And so in the last, I'd say, two years, we have found an awful lot of information and references to enslaved people and people of color in the individual family letters, which give us a clue to not just their identities, but to how they were seen by uh, the family, the, the, the owners of Sylvester Manor. So this is a piece about Julia A. Havens Johnson. One of the most iconic figures in Sylvester Manor history is Julia A. Havens Johnson, a freeborn biracial woman who spent her life in and around Sylvester Manor. As researchers and storytellers, we return to her life story again and again, and often remark that Julia has been on my mind as we begin a day. We feel that she guides us into new areas of study that deepen and expand her story and that of her family and the manor. She was a freeborn woman of color. As Professor Evan Horsford stated in July 1884, at the dedication of the monument at the Quaker Cemetery on Manor Grounds, Julia had been a witness to every event of sorrow and joy at Sylvester Manor over multiple generations. Her presence within the house and on the grounds is imbued with the memory of her life and of the people and events that occurred there. She was born in freedom to a formerly enslaved woman but her story and her place in our history make her family and an ancestor of the place. She is the only person of color of, of, from Sylvester Manor for whom we have a photographic image taken when she was 78 years of age. Julia was born in 1809 to, to an African-American Shelter Island woman named Dido. The Shelter Island Presbyterian Church records indicate that a second child born to Dido died that same year, making it likely that she had delivered twins and that Julia was the surviving child. No father has ever been enlisted for Julia, but documents indicate that she was biracial, listed as mulatto, the child of a white man. 
Evidence suggests that Julia's mother, Dido, was born in 1772 to an enslaved woman named Savener, who was held in bondage by Desire Brown. Desire married Nicol Havens in 1770, and Savener moved to the Havens house with her. We don't know very much about Savener, except that she had been enslaved in the household of Daniel Brown of, of Shelter Island. We believe that she was born on Shelter Island and may have descended from one of the original enslaved families brought to the island from Barbados by Nathaniel Sylvester to the provisioning plantation. During the Quaker monument dedication, when Professor Horsford recognized Julia's continued presence, he also indicated that she was descended from the original servants of Nathaniel Sylvester. At this point, there is no documentation to support that, that links Savener, Dido, and Julia to one of the 24 enslaved people listed on Nathaniel Sylvester's 1680 Last Will and Testament, and we may never be, be able to prove it definitively. But Julia's attachment and constancy at the manor points to a deeper connection, a relationship to both the land and to the members of the Sylvester family. We consider her an ancestor of the place. No record of Dido's father has been found, but she grew up enslaved along Desire's children, including, including Rensselaer, Gloriana, and Catherine Mary Havens, and Nicol Havens' children from his first marriage, including Jonathan, Esther Sarah, and Mary Catherine, both of whom married Sylvester descendants. Dido would remain connected to them throughout her life. In 1789, at 17 years of age, Dido gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Ginny. Her father was unnamed, and she was born enslaved. Desire Brown Havens manumitted, she freed Dido in 1801 when she was 29 years of age, but her daughter Ginny remained in bondage the property of desire. As a free woman, Dido continued to live and work for the Havens family, traveling with desire to New York City, upstate, and Connecticut to visit and care for the Havens daughters, while Ginny remained at home on Shelter Island. When, Ju when, excuse me, when Julia and her twin were born in 1809, Dido was 36 years old. She was a free woman. She continued to live on Shelter Island, working for the Havens, and doing work at Sylvester Manor. Her daughter, Ginny, lived with desire, and like Dido before her, frequently traveled to visit family and friends off of the island. Letters found sent between the Havens' siblings include frequent greetings to Dido and reports on how Ginny is doing. Tell Dido that Ginny is very well, and for the most part, a pretty good girl. She sends her love also to all the other Negroes. Despite the frequent references and messages to Dido in the correspondence, no mention has been found of the father of either Ginny or Julia. As researchers, we have come to believe that they were fathered by the same man, a white man from Shelter Island. And although Dido never used the last name Havens even as a free woman, Records for her daughter, Julia, ident identified her as Julia Dido, a reference to her mother, and later as Julia A. Havens. In a letter written by Rensselaer Havens on March 14, 1811, to his sister, Mary Catherine Lamadou, we learned of Ginny's death when she was 22 years old. He wrote, the death of Ginny was truly sudden and shocking. We hope it was as sudden a transportation of her soul to eternal happiness and glory. It was a great shock and caused much distress to our dear mother. Desire's distress was so great over the death of Ginny that her family delayed telling her of her own daughter Fanny's illness. We don't know how this news was conveyed to Dido or what her reaction was but we assume that probably Mary Catherine Lamadou had to tell her that her daughter was dead. Between 1811 and 1820, 
Dido entered into a common law marriage with a formerly enslaved man named Comus Fanny, who lived and worked on Shelter Island. In 1820, Comus, after working and saving for over 20 years to accumulate $700, bought 23 acres of land from Sylvester Deering in what is now known as Deering Harbor. Both Dido and Comus continue to appear in Sylvester Manor accounts for services and payments made for work they provided, cutting wood or selling turkeys to the house in exchange for such products as sugar, flour, cloth, and cash. Hints of Julia's childhood has been found in the archive, such as a notation by Mary Catherine concerning Julia and Jane Havens. Jane was another was a, the daughter of a formerly enslaved woman who had been enslaved by Henry Packer Deering and lived in the customs house in Zack Harbor, just by the by. <laughs> Mary Catherine provided both uh, Julia and Jane with schooling and arranged for them to be tutored by Phineas King on Shelter Island. We learn also through letters that Julia and Dido traveled to New York City from Shelter Island uh, in 1817. And when we find facts like that, it makes you think, makes you imagine, how did they get from Shelter Island to New York City? What was that experience like? Did they go by boat? Did they go by coach? How did it affect you know, Julia as a young child, the things that she was seeing? These facts and, and little details that we learned from these letters create a whole world for us to imagine what it was like. In 1818, Dido and Comus lost a child, a daughter they named Sophia. Her death is listed in the Shelter Island Presbyterian church records. There's no age listed for Sophia, but we assume that she was a young child. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the 1830 census, the family is listed, and we learn that in 1831, we learn this from letters as well, Dido suffered a, debil a debilitating stroke that left her unable to fully communicate and impacted her movements. Again, the Haven sisters, Mary Catherine, Esther Sarah, and Catherine Mary, expressed deep concern for Dido's health and welfare. However, they complained that her husband Comus was a miserly man, and they, they took turns to ensure that she had everything that she needed, and that she was helped by her friends and her neighbors, as well as her daughter Julia. Following her stroke, Dido recovered somewhat, but she passed away on July 19th 1834, at the age of 62. She is buried in what we call the Afro-Indigenous burial ground at Sylvester Manor, along with Julia's unnamed twin, her daughter Sophia, and her husband Comus Fanning. Samuel Smith Gardner, Mary Catherine's son-in-law, and then the proprietor of the manor, purchased her coffin in Greenport and charged Julia for it. Her grave was dug by the sons of David Hempstead, a black man who had worked for a time as the manager of, of Sylvester Manor. The photography collection at Sylvester Manor is quite extensive due to the interest by members of the Horsford family in the 19th century. Professor Evan Horsford opened the first daguerreotype studio in Albany in 1840, and through the years, he and his daughter Cornelia both photographed and brought photographers to the manor to make photographs of the house, lands, and the family and their friends. From his contacts, the Magazine of American History published an article about Sylvester Manor and its history written by Martha J. Lamb. The article told the story of Shelter Island, the land of the native Manhansett people, and Nathaniel Sylvester, his wife Grizzle, and the subsequent generations that came after him. It also portrayed the manor as a place of enslavement of African people. Oops. Well, anyway, we'll keep going. There you go. There you go. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. It also, <laughs> to illustrate the article, photographs were taken of the house, 
that we use as engravings, along with an image of an old woman. This was a portrait of Julia Havens. She was photographed wearing a long dress with a white apron and her hair wrapped in a piece of material seated by the back doorway of the manor, with her eyes looking straight ahead into the middle distance. Her features are dimmed and she appears as an old woman, but her presence and her importance is felt by the viewer. This is the only image we have of a person of color from Sylvester Manor, and we have studied it closely, and I look at it often, looking for clues and impressions of Julia. The images in sepia tones, which highlight her light brown complexion, confirming her status as a mixed race woman. Her nose is straight with full cheeks, and her eyes appear to be light colored, gray or blue. Around her neck, she wears a kerchief, and in her hand, she holds a cloth as if she had been working when interrupted to sit and pose for the photograph. I imagine she was told to sit still, to not move her head, and to look straight ahead. Perhaps the purpose of the photographs was not explained to her, but since cameras and photography were something that she would have been familiar with, she wouldn't have found it odd. The article appeared was published in November 1887 when Julia was 78 years old, and the engraving had a caption that read, one of the last slaves of Sylvester Manor. Julia had been born free and had never been enslaved, but for editorial purposes, it suited the, to cast her in such a role, despite the fact that three years earlier, she had been declared at the, at the monument dedication, who had praised her as a descendant of the enslaved people and honored her in her place at the manor. Nowhere in the article, was her correct status mentioned. As the years went by, Julia sold her land that she had inherited from her stepfather and her land and her house, and she moved to Sag Harbor to live in the Eastville community, where many of the second generation people of color from Shelter Island had moved to in order to own their own homes. Sometime between 1807, excuse me, 1907 and 1908, Julia A. Havens died at almost 100 years of age. She had told the Horsford daughters that she desired to have her body returned to Shelter Island to be buried in the burial ground with members of her family. Now, during the spring of 2023, just last year, from our archives, we found a letter written by Cornelia Horsford in 1915. Speaking about the burial ground at Sylvester Manor and of her plans to build a monument at the site near Julia's grave. At the top of a slope within the circle of pine trees marked by a large flat stone. Her plan was never realized, but this was the first and only description of the placement of a grave within the site that we have found and we believe that over 200 people are buried there. Julia, along with all the others, were laid to rest here and buried anonymously, but with Cornelia's letter, it is fitting that the only grave we can identify belongs to Julia. As we move forward with our work, I know she will continue to guide us and inspire deeper looks and imaginings into the lives of all the people of Sylvester Manor, whose memory is held here in the manor house and throughout the landscape. In fact, as soon as I finished writing this piece, new evidence started to come to light, and we are following that trail now. In the back portion of the manor house, this is called the slave staircase, and we keep the photograph, a copy of the photograph of Julia there. These are the back stairs, the servant stairs, and to honor the women of Sylvester Manor, the enslaved women, people, women of color, we place their names on the stairs as a permanent tribute. Thank you very much. Before we jump into to my piece, um, it occurred to me we maybe should answer the question, uh, or address the question, where did the enslaved come from? Uh, so we've been asked in the past, uh, you know, were there slave markets <clears throat> here? Um, there really weren't. It was, um, I don't know how you'd really characterize it, but it seems like 
we've seen letters where, where someone would write to a friend in New York City to keep an eye out for a, a likely youth of between 12 and 14 years old, um, you know, to work in my leather making business or something like that. Um, it seems to me that there were not, I've never really seen references to auctions here. Um, but you get a lot of the runaway ads with, with descriptions of people. Um, the, we don't even know the origin place of many, many people. One exception is Adam, who was enslaved in Zagaponic, who was described as being born in Congo. And um, Adam's a fascinating guy because he becomes the uh, patriarch of a, a long-lived family of black people who remained in Zagaponic for many, many years. I think up until about the 1930s, there was a descendant um, working on one of the farms there. Um, and then there's a the question of where did they go, uh, which is, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I want to say one thing about Eastville. There's been a great replacement, if you will, uh, during the Great Migration after the Civil War in the census records. You see endless numbers of uh, names of black and colored people, as they were described, um, and their birthplace, which would be in the Carolinas or Virginia, places like that. Uh, there's a Purdue family from South Carolina that has several generations um, in, I think it's on Liberty in, in uh, Eastville. And um, one of the striking things is, unlike the Julia Havens story of a family that remained, uh, many people after their abandonment or the end of slavery in 1827 uh, here simply disappear. And that, that is a, a puzzle that sort of yet to be um, unraveled. Let's say anything about school sure. and I'll do my thing. Sure. So, as David said, we often were asked where the African people came from. Did they come from the West Indies? Um, and because the economic ties between and the east end of Long Island and New England and the north uh, to the West Indies was very prevalent in, in providing them with goods. Yes, enslaved people were transported from the West Indies. What we have found on, on Shelter Island and at Sylvester Manor specifically is more of a generational attrition. So, like Desire Brown, whose family were slaveholders on Shelter Island, um, her father was very active in the Revolutionary War. When she, when she married, she took her, her enslaved woman with her. And that happened over and over again. Uh, from last rules and testaments, as David mentioned, enslaved people were bequeathed to children or wives uh, and then passed along generationally. Um, and so it began to feel like the answer to that question, especially for us at Sylvester Manor, was they're from here as well as, as much as anyone who came here from away, from, from England, uh, from New England as Puritans or pilgrims. The idea that these enslaved people came from other, from outside, from the South, which doesn't happen really until after the Civil War. Just that perception of these people were from here. Their grandparents and great-grandparents had been brought here with the first settlers. That changes the story entirely and how we perceive the history of this place. And that. So I've been working on a book on and off for maybe four years at this point. And you know, running a newspaper gets in the way frequently. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I've got to be very interested in a lot of this. <laughs> well, uh, this got very out of order. But anyway, this is an engraving of Sugar Islands. Those are English planters and enslaved there. Um, you know, it makes me think, actually, um, which we've alluded to, the, the way I put it, and it, maybe it's a bit sort of facile, but you could be the meanest, the poorest dirt farmer here in East Hampton or South Hold or, or somewhere else in, the, in New England and still get a piece of the slavery economy. You could grow a bushel of flax and give the flax seed to a member of the Deering 
family or the Gardner family or the Sylvester's to bring to the Sugar Islands. And the, and the re, you know, we didn't actually really get to the, the nut of it. Sugar was so lucrative and really was the big economic generator for the Atlantic region for more than a century, probably a century and a half. Uh, it was kind of the oil of its day. It was so valuable that it made much more sense economically for planters to import their food from New England and uh, coastal North America than to grow it. Because it, uh, the labor of an enslaved person to grow potatoes or to chase cattle around would be so much more valuable to him, to the planter, if that labor, that, that day of labor was put into sugar. Sugar is shipped, uh, you know, we all sort of grew up hearing about the tri triangle trade, it's far more complex like that. I kind of think it's like the, the, the sort of like a yo-yo of trade, We're going every which way, connecting, um, you know, Barbados to Sag Harbor, and Sag Harbor to England and West Africa. Um, you know, the royal family were um, big investors both in the sugar industry and in um, slavery voyages. <laughs> Um, you know, and this, this begins in the 1620s, which is kind of amazing. And, and uh, so what's a good one? Oh, here, this is just something nice to look at while we do a little bit here. Okay, so I'm interested in Nathaniel Hunting. He was the, the, the one who uh, kind of was the, 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 you know, it was his church records that started this all. And we'll, I assume we're getting close to question time, so we'll maybe cut this a little bit. Okay, As Hunting arrives here about. Uh, for good, I think it's uh, 1801. He, he's here, sort of, for a trial run in 1899. Um, and one of the wonderful things in his records, he writes about bringing a barrel of books with him from Connecticut. And uh, this is the context. So Nathaniel Hunting was about the only university-educated person in the township in his day, and filled his shelves with books by Cotton Mather and Sir Francis Drake, a French grammar, a Hebrew grammar. John Calvin's sermons on the epistle to the Ephesians, by then more than 100 years old. Midway through Hunting's term, he helped oversee the construction of a new town church with sills long enough to allow every male of age enough to bear arms to sit. A person did not need to be a member of the church to attend worship, but the right to have one's children baptized was reserved for members. Hunting adopted an easier covenant that's um, had you swear to become a member of the church in those days. It's, uh, um, it was very it's a long story. <laughs> so the, this, this halfway covenant at the Newtown Church seemed to have accelerated the rate, rate at which the church grew, including taking in black members. It is notable that the new church, built with separate pews to accommodate, was built with separate pews to accommodate the town's black residents, whether free, indentured, or enslaved. This was formalized in 1732 by a vote of the town trustees that Negroes may sit in the second gallery west side. Of the 362 people who Hunting wrote owned the covenant during his time in East Hampton, he recorded the names of 11 enslaved residents and one Indian maid. And I'm gonna just describe several of them here, if right directly from Hunting's records. He says, November 17, 1723, Peter, a Negro servant of Cap Captain Burnett, when baptized, Peter Negro propounded to him a confession of faith, agreeable to a short catechism in the book entitled Servants of Abraham. This owning of God and engagement of ye same, as usual, at ye baptism of other adult persons. May 29, 1724, Sharper, or Sharper, Negro servant of Matthew Mulford, propounding a confession to him as above Peter Negro. May 3rd, 1724, Rose, a Negro woman of Captain Mulford. October 23, 1725, Hannah, Negro servant of widow Osborne. March 12, 1776, Dinah, Indian maid. Black baptisms included Bristow, Samine, Silas, uh, who was Sharper's son, we think. Phyllis, Benny, Maul, and her children, Cuffy, Judah, and Phyllis. There was Daniel, Peter, Abigail, and Chris. And he wrote that these were people who take the Lord to be their God and to partake of baptism as a badge of their discipleship. And for those of them that have children under their charge, they have professed their dire, the desire and resolution to bring them up for God. Hunting's successor in the East Hampton pul pulpit, the Reverend Samuel Buell, 
may have had a different standard of church membership or members had died off. At any rate, he recorded 81 communicants when he took over in 1746. It was five months before he recorded the first enslaved church member, joined in communion Seth Parsons, Negro woman. Then, eight years after his installation, the next, September 14, 1754, received in ye Negro man of Josiah Hed Hedges, Petros. Also in 1754, he received in full communion Shem, Negro man, Esquire Millers. In 1785 or 86, he recorded the 300th member of his church, Phyllis, a Negro woman. Reverend Buell did not often record the names of the enslaved or their enslavers among the children he baptized after taking over these tempted pastorate from Nathaniel Hunting. Rather, they are listed by number alone, six black the same day. On April 27, two blacks in May, they counted, though as judged by his including them in a total tally made after a particularly busy day of baptisms in 1748, a child of David Mulford's Job and six blacks mentioned on the first page make number 105. Buell recorded the death in 1747 of my Negro girl, Jean. She was less than two years old. But among those he baptized that year were Pameter, a child of Paris at Sec Harbor, another child of Paris at Sec Harbor. He then baptized a child of Peter, Negro servant, then a few years later, a child of Peter Negroes. In 1764, Buell noted he his baptism, baptism of Aaron Isaacs, a Jew. And that is, the whole Aaron Isaacs story is fascinating, separate matter. Um, Isaacs was indeed an enslaver. The same year he baptized Hagar, Negro, Negro servant of Esquire Millers, Joe, a Negro servant of Captain Mulford's, Abigail Negro, and her children, Dinah Peggy, Peg Negro, Talmadge's Negro, and three children, Peg Negro, Hitty Negro, Charles Negro, Negro son, Judge Negro, Virgil Negro. And this goes on and on and on. How we missed all of this, reading these books, I don't know. And finally, when Lund Beecher, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, took over the church in 1802, the black members included Nance, the wife of Rufus, Rebecca, the wife of Amos Cuffey, Ned, a freeman, and Dinah, a slave. And I think that's all of the excerpt, but I would want to add one thing about Lund Beecher, so fascinating. We, we got very interested in... Um, Two uh, indentured servants there, uh, uh, Drusilla and Rachel, um, <coughs> who were uh, brought when they were five years old to take care of I think, two of the first Beecher children. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe was born after the family, and Drusilla and Rachel moved to Litchfield, Connecticut. Um, and we thought we'd sort of heard the last of them, but we were giving a talk, I think it was at Belport Library maybe six months ago, and a, a woman uh, sat up at the mention of all of this, and I'm gonna see if I have, there it is, okay. So we're not even talking about Drusilla. I just have this slide up, we're talking about I don't know what, and this woman, you know, and I really thought she was gonna give it to us. I don't know if you remember that, but it was, it was tense. And she sort of raises her hand and goes, I think that's my great, great, great grandmother. And she's a, she was, a, a, this is the woman, we never yeah. got her name. She, I think she's a court child or, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, then we began to look and Julia, uh, Julie Green, the Southampton Town historian, came up with a, a Bible that had the, all of Drusilla Crook and her descendants listed in it. So we have this extraordinary story about a, a young woman she may have been mixed race, she may have been Montauket, she may have been uh, entirely of African heritage, in the household of Harriet Beecher Stowe and her troubled abolitionist older sister um, that starts in East Hampton. Um, and it's an amazing piece of information that Drusilla, who started working for the Beechers when she was five years old to take care of a baby, lived long enough, we will leave, to move back to Long Island and become a matriarch of a family where we you know, have a descendant who we, uh, who we have much to one day in Um So I think it's probably a good question time, unless you have anything that I forgot. No, I think so, it's time for... Yeah, so I think uh, maybe I'll listen to questions and repeat them. All right. Um, anyone with a thought? Oh, hi, Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> Any of this 
ever reach the school system? Great question. There you are. What you do? I'm a little bit of a Yeah. Lovely. Yes. We have started in the last year, no, I'd say the last 18 months, going on two years now. We received a grant. We partnered with the Sad Harbor Cinema because we were starting to do research in Sad Harbor. Uh, and we received a grant from Senator Chuck Schumer's office uh, for $200,000 that enabled us to uh, hire a, a project director or a project assistant uh, to create a, a doc short form documentary film that was premiered last February at the Sagar Cinema and to develop a curriculum for school children. Uh, David will talk more about this later, but among our first volunteers were kids from the high school um, who we would say, look at this book and this is what you're looking for. You're looking for people who could possibly be people of color. And they really got into it. Uh, as Sylvester Manor, we've also worked to create a curriculum for the uh, shelter on the fifth grade. Um, that's being, that was that started last year, that we continued again this spring. And so little by little, we're, we're starting to outreach to schools. At first, you know, we were very excited about it and thought, well, this is a no-brainer. Schools would love this. And we sent letters to all the principals and deans, and nobody answered us. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're five years in. Word is spread. We're not shy. We've been around. And so little by little, we're starting to get more and more interest from school groups. Don Marie mentioned that there was a place on Sylvester Manor where you think the, the indigenous and, and people of African descent were buried. David, you and I have talked about where is that place in East Hampton? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is we don't know, but we suspect. Uh, one of the slides I showed there was a Peggy Negro who was enslaved to one of the gardeners. I don't remember the year she died, maybe he does. Um, but uh, her grave marker and nets are just one of two for enslaved uh, or, or yeah, people in East Hampton. Ned died free. Um, she did not, as best we could tell. So she's here in the, the South End burial ground, uh, kind of under a cedar tree. And she's kind of at the end of a row of grave stones. And then there's a gap, this long gap, that goes and then it begins again with stones. And it's prime real estate overlooking the pond. Um, so you've got this section of that cemetery without headstones. And that it suggests to me that that might be where the poor people of color were buried. There's also a reference across the street, uh, just one reference in the East Tampa record, some, uh, about a, uh, an Indian burial ground, I think it's called. Uh, that would be somewhere near the Maidstone. Uh, whatever it's called these days, uh, in. And it may have been an Indian burial ground, but it could well have been a burial ground of the African people. One of the things about these burial grounds, and, and, and I encourage you all to visit Sylvester Manor, because you can actually see and feel this space. Um, it's, it's on a rise of, of quite a substantial bump of land. And it reminded me, for all the world, of the, the um, burial ground at Mount Vernon, where the enslaved people were buried. Again, it's on this rise, kind of set off under the pines. And it's a very similar feeling. Um, way, way, way in the back. Was, we're familiar, or we've heard stories of the way slaves were treated and what their life was like in the South. What was their life like up here? I, I want to do one real quick down here too. Um, horrible, in a word. Um, and there are a lot of stories of extraordinary violence, um, rape, uh, deprivation, and then the, the thing I think that may be the most heart-wrenching of all is family separation. Unlike in the South, you have large plantation style it's enslavement. Um, in, but here, there was a great deal of uh, dispersal of family members 
the nature of a smallholder farm here might be that they could really only afford to have one or two additional mouths to feed in the household, which meant children were being sold. And as parents, those of you, you know, you probably take any number of lashings and physical mutilations and deprivations not to be separated from your children. So when we've heard in the past that perhaps slavery is more benign in the North, it, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, you take away someone's free will, you know, how is that benign? So, don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, however you think about it, it was cruel. There was cruelty, whether there were you know, horrific acts of violence. There were uh, the story of Julia, you know, her mother Dido. We believe that it was the same man who was the father of her, you know, her three children. We have a slight idea of who he might have been, but I'm not ready to say that publicly yet. Um, and the circumstance, you know, was it rape? Was it coercion? Was it something else? Was it a connection? Was it love? We don't know. The fact that she was a free woman when she gave birth to Julia and Julia's twin um, and was 36 years old, cast vivid light. She was not enslaved in someone's home. And so these are all the questions that, that come up. Yes? Is there any attempt to do DNA of, of someone, no. you know, slave family versus yeah. Well, we don't we don't have a descendant community yet. Don't we don't know yet. And uh, specifically at Sylvester Manor, at the burial ground, where, as I said, we believe, uh, and archaeology has proven this, that over 200 people are buried. We will never dig there. We will do ground penetrating radar. We will map the area to see just how far it extends. We believe that the placement of it, because it is, it is pretty near the house, um, that it might have been, probably was, an ancestral burial site of the Manhansen people. And when the Sylvesters came, they just used this land to also bury the enslaved people. So that's why we call it the Afro-Indigenous burial ground. Yes, over there. Hi. Oh, presentation. Uh, I just uh, have a question relating to the relevance of slavery to the village of the standard. Um, clearly, so that's a matter of the dominant feature. Um, but I think in your presentation, you said slaves were everywhere in every house in the standard. But the numbers that you gave relating to the church would indicate that that wasn't the case. So I'm just curious uh, what what you think what you think the population was relative to the number of families, but the white families in Japan. And were they slaves at that time going back before emancipation? Yeah, there's a bunch of questions in there, but one of the fascinating things about the numbers is it seems to be between 12 and 20 percent in any uh, enslaved or black in any um, period of time throughout the roughly 180 years of slavery that we're talking about here. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Of Mulford Farm, I forget which era it was. There were as many as 12 enslaved people there at one time. Um, the 1770 house, which I think was at Josiah Dayton, what very frequently you see transactions of people being sold or bought um, from, from that property across the street of where the tannery was at the Maidstone. And if I may be mistaken, I think that was an Osborne tannery. There are clear references to enslaved people living, presumably working there. Um, I mean, if you've seen a tannery in a place like Morocco, it's certainly extraordinary. Um, basically, anyone who has a street named after them here. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is really true. But, bizarrely, I think, the exception of Edwards Lane, and I think that's because we got picked. I, really, I think um, the first Edwards, William Edwards, I forget his wife's name, but anyway, she was a drunk, and there was all sorts of lawsuits, and I think they were kicked out of town, sent him against him. But everybody else, you know, Buell, 
hunting, Dayton, Oswald, James, right? He had an enslaved Indian boy named uh, Hopewell. Um, really, all of the old families were enslavers, and not just in one generation. Uh, Hedges, uh, in Sac Harbor, and Southampton, and you know, Pelotros, and um, Longus, and, and so, Pearsons, oh yeah, Pearsons, big time. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, that's right, Corinth. Um, so the answer is, yeah, all of them. And their economic output. These are among a lot of my ancestors, right? Other than these good-for-nothing Edwardses. But on the other side, they're sent from the hunters. And uh, through that, you know, Gardner, who knows what. But anyway, so unlike in the South, where there really was a, a great separation from the wealth that was created, the value that was created by enslaved people. Here in the North, there really wasn't that separation. My office is on hunting family land. It's worth, I don't know how much now, the building's garbage, but you know. Um, some fragment, some tiny piece of a coin in my pocket is wealth, essentially, that was created by enslaved people that my family owned. And we've never, as a country or a town, really reckoned with it. And, and I, I think that gets to sort of, well, now that we know, what do we do? Sort of thing. Because that was a long answer to it, and it's a very complicated question. But yeah, it was ubiquitous. Gardeners were uh, extraordinary slave owners. And then the other piece of it is, uh, there are the Sherrills. Recompense Sherrill was a weaver and ran a, almost like sweatshop conditions of producing 220 yards of worsted and, and this and that. Um, and the gardeners were um, taking it somewhere on a boat. We suspect that they're not taking it to New York or Hartford or Boston, which typically would have its own union communities, but to one of the sugar islands. And that's certainly where a lot of the records of shipping um, that we've seen. Daring was supercargo on a, a gardener, one or two gardener trips, uh, selling herring, horses, oxen, barrel staves, and I think they even had a cooper aboard to make that. And so if you're someone who's cutting, I don't know, hickory or oak here in the woods, selling it to Gardner, who then is turning it into hickory staves and selling it, uh, hey, um, you've got a piece of the slave uh, business coming and going. With some wealth created in the Sugar Islands or the labor here, it's inescapable. Man, I'm going on to There you go. Yeah. So, it's OK. Yeah. Did you, in your researching, see any records of escapes and recapture? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Was it recaptured? He returned. He returned. He returned. Um, they're called runaway ads. We call them self-emancipating. Um, they're very useful to us because they're very detailed. Um, they give descriptions of the individuals, what they were wearing, so we know how they were clothed. Their physical description, um, their height, their, you know, their complexion, if they walk with a limp. Um, so we, we get a lot of information from these advertisements. Um, there was one for a man named Crank, um, who was enslaved in South Holt, and if I get this right, I can't get this right. I can't remember who his enslaver was. But there was a period where he, <laughs> he left, and there was an ad placed for him. And the ad was very descriptive of what he was wearing. And during our partnership with the Sac Harbor Cinema, we had the honor of working with Sac Harbor artist Michael Butler, sitting in the back. <laughs> there he is. And he very wonderfully painted a portrait of Crank based on the description in the ad. From the research that we did, we learned that Crank had a wife, and her name was Flora. And she lived in a neighboring house uh, in South Hold. And she was expecting a child. And this probably was the reason that Crank left where he was living and the enslavers. 
He did, we believe, return to them. We don't know what the consequences of that was after he returned after the birth of their daughter, whose name was Diana. And eventually he and Flora were manumitted and they moved to Shelter Island where they had a house and where Dinah grew up and married a man um, who was a sailor, name of, his last name was Williams, so she was known as Dinah Williams. Diana Williams, she was renowned as being a, a good nurse, which she had learned from her mother. On Shelter Island, there is a place called Dinah's Rock. There's a road called Dinah Rock, Dinah Rock Road. You may have seen it or heard of it. That's named for Diana Williams, the child, the daughter of Flora and Crank. Crank, who had run away and who was betrayed in the runaway ad. Let me just talk very quickly. Another one is of Diane Bingo mm -hmm. and this uh, East Hampton Town Trustees, I don't remember the year, voted to spend money to pay two men to take Bingo back to his master, a member of the Fanning family on the North Fork. Uh, much later, there's a Mingo Fanning living as a free black man in Southampton. It would be wonderful if it was the same person. Don't know. But, you know, here we have the East Hampton Town Trustees um, paying to return a, a freedom seeker to his enslaver. I think Did we have time for one more. Make one more. I just got an interesting one. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm wondering if you looked at property tax during this period, and they're usually, I think always, um, Suffolk County divided between personal property and real property, and have you... Yes, we have, we, have, we, have, like slave and we, have, we have looked at some of the tax records. They don't list names. So if, if you were a slaveholder, it might make a record of that with a number. Uh, or just uh, including, including that you owned people, that you were in slavery, uh, but they don't give any names. You had a quick one. No. no. You have a quick one, Nancy. Um, Valerie, you often talk about how a landscape has memory, and I was wondering if you would mind closing the evening by talking about it. Okay. So, as you've heard, I'm a photographer, that's my background, and I'm not a historian, or I wasn't a historian until now. And so, to help me understand this work, to help me deal with this work, because it can be hard and uh, uh, emotionally heavy to deal with, I use my camera by, work, by walking around Sylvester Manor, photographing, and seeking memories. And so what Nina is referring to is that in the talks and the tours that I give at Sylvester Manor, which include the manor house and the grounds and the burial grounds and such, I will often say that the landscape itself, because it is so old, because it has been intact for so long, belonging to this one family, and that it, it, it very much resembles how it was when the first Africans were brought from Barbados which, by the way, is my ancestral homeland, that the, the landscape itself holds the memory of the trauma of all that happened there, of the land being dispossessed from the indigenous Manhansen people who had lived there for thousands of years, to the African people who were brought there against their will, to the Sylvester family who carved out their, their living there and made their lives that descended through 12 generations so that the land is still preserved today to hold those memories, to hold, to hold that feeling of all that happened there. And for, not just for me, but I think for visitors who come to Sylvester Manor, once you drive up or walk up that driveway, you feel yourself being sucked into something. You can't put your finger on it. It's something in the wind, it's something in the trees, it's the sound of the birds, it's the, it's the sight of the water. Um, it has made visitors say stupid things, such as, it's so beautiful, it wouldn't be bad to be enslaved here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and 
I controlled within myself. <laughs> but it, as stupid as that sounds, it is a reaction to the place. It is a reaction to there is something visceral within the nature here that makes you react. And whether you interpret it correctly or not as being a beautiful place and therefore how bad could it have been, or a place that despite being so beautiful, it is and it was a prison when you couldn't leave it. And in some ways for the Sylvesters as well, because they were on this island and uh, they were the only you know, people there. And so that also created this bond, this, this interaction between the Sylvester European family and the enslaved Africans who they had brought with them. So with that, we'd like to thank you once again for this incredible <laughs>